Hi there, guys. Uh, so um, I'm here today to talk about Git Backed versus API-driven CMSs. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this talk here really is to talk about the modern reality of content management um, and how these two different types of CMSs are playing into it. Um, and my goal here really isn't to evangelize either one. It's to give you guys the information you need to basically choose the tool that fits the jobs that you're working on. Um, so before I get started, inter introduction to myself. My name is Chris McRae. I'm head of developer relations at forestry.io. Um, we are uh, the leading get back CMS for Hugo and Jekyll sites, and we let you uh, edit, build, and deploy your uh, blazingly fast, super secure static sites. Um, so before we actually jump into uh, uh, get backed versus API driven, I want to talk about uh, old versus new. Um, and essentially what I'm talking about here is the traditional CMS uh, versus the uh, headless CMS that we're seeing now. So these are things like WordPress, Drupal, uh, Craft CMS, uh, and Kirby. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar with CMSs like this. Um, and then we have these new headless CMSs, which are things like Forestry, uh, Netlify CMS, Contentful, and uh, Get Cockpit, for example. Um, and the big difference between these two different uh, CMSs is the traditional stack is that monolithic uh, stack that you're used to, where the CMS is hosted on a server front to back. Um, and that has a lot of problems with reliability and performance and security. Uh, and this headless stack that uh, we're seeing now uh, aims to solve a lot of those problems. And it aims to do that by decoupling content management from production environments. Uh, and what I mean by this is uh, your content management is separate from your front end and your back end. Uh, uh, the CMS doesn't know about presentation at all, and it solves a lot of the problems that comes along with uh, performance, reliability, and security. So I'm going to quickly go into a little bit of detail on that. So the problem with their traditional stack, uh, number one, is vendor lock-in. Uh, and this really comes from that uh, monolithic framework. Uh, when, you're when your front end uh, and your back end and your content management are all highly coupled together, essentially what you're doing is giving content editors a CMS at the cost of developer freedom. Um, so when you install something like WordPress, uh, you're basically uh, for, uh, putting yourself into a proprietary content model and front end standards. And what this means is the longer you use a tool like this, the harder it actually gets to move away uh, down the road if you decide that it's not good for your business uh, performance. Um, and another big problem with uh, this vendor lock-in is it makes it really hard to repurpose your content for multiple front ends. So what we're seeing these days is a lot of companies are uh, starting off building you know, a simple e-commerce website or a static site, and they realize uh, a couple months later that they want to go into mobile or they want to uh, go into different types of platforms. And with a traditional CMS, it actually makes it a very big challenge to do that. Um, so the next big thing is poor performance. And this is really where uh, the Achilles heel of these, this monolithic CMS comes in. Um, and the reason for that is uh, they're almost all exclusively dynamically rendered. So when someone comes to your, comes to your site uh, to re and requests a page, uh, the CMS has to actually dynamically generate the markup for every single request. Um, and that adds a lot of overhead when people are visiting pages. Um, so I'm going to actually break this down for you just to give you guys a little bit of content, context. So uh, you know, somebody comes to your site uh, in the browser. They, hit, uh, uh, they send a request off to a server. That server is going to make a bunch of requests off to uh, the CMS, which then has to go make requests off to a database. Uh, it takes the data from the database, builds the template, and sends the HTML and assets back to the browser. And uh, the big problem with that is uh, all of that overhead has to begin before the browser can even start downloading the page. So what we're looking at here is this time to first byte. All, when all of this is happening, the browser's sitting there waiting for the server to send this stuff back. Um, and so this example I'm showing here is actually from Forestry's website. Um, before we made the move to static. It was initially actually part of our backend infrastructure. It was part of our Rails app. And our time to first byte was actually over a second. So every time somebody would hit a page, you'd be sitting there waiting a whole second before it even start downloading. Um, and Google released a stat in 2016 saying that uh, the average mobile visitor 
will actually leave your site if it takes more than three seconds to load. So we were actually well over that. Um, so we identified that we wanted to fix that up. So you'll see here our media was actually well over that three second mark, and so was our JavaScript. Um, so what our uh, initial approach would have been is what we are used to in this traditional stack. Well, let's add some infrastructure in place to actually uh, try and uh, optimize performance. So again, we go over this. We've got all of these requests happening step by step. We're sending HTML and assets back. And step one would be to add in a page cache and a database cache. And essentially what we're doing here is when uh, the server is making requests back to the CMS, if you've got content that isn't changing, you've got markup that is exactly the same for every user, we cache that. Um, and what ends up happening there is uh, uh, there's no overhead. The content goes straight to the browser, uh, and we don't have to wait that one second for the content to come down. Um, but what happens if we have dynamic content? Uh, you have uh, user content, uh, like e-commerce recommendations for different products. In that case, we can't cache the, the HTML for the page because uh, it's different for every visitor. So we put a database cache in front of that. Um, and that way, when the CMS requests, uh, makes requests off to the database, um, uh, we can actually cache the common requests uh, and move straight on to rendering the markup and sending it down to the browser as fast as possible. Um, so the next big thing we run into is uh, you add a CDN to this monolithic stack. And the reason for that is uh, uh, if your server is hosted in North America and you've got someone in Australia requesting a page, uh, what you're going to end up running into there is that distance is going to increase that time to first byte, and it's going to increase the time it takes for images and assets to download. So a CDN essentially distributes your cache content and assets all over the world. So when someone uh, requests a page in Australia, they actually get the content from a server in Australia, which makes that process a lot faster. Um, and in a, in a simple setup, you're only sending over your assets. You can even make this setup even more complex, where you're actually serving the, the page cache to uh, the CDN as well, and then you have to deal with a whole bunch of complex over, overhead there. Uh, and then the last thing we've been seeing in the last uh, few years is we're also adding in uh, um, APIs into this stack. So uh, on the front end, using JavaScript, uh, we're decorating HTML and pulling in dynamic content after the fact just to give the illusion of performance increase. And this just adds another layer of complexity onto the stack. But what the end result of all this is, is our time to first byte is much, much lower. We've, instead of having a second, you've got you know, hundreds of milliseconds. So uh, the user's getting the HTML right away, and they're seeing images come in a lot faster. Um, but when it comes down to brass tacks, that's just a ridiculous amount of overhead. And I know everyone in this room feels like uh, there's got to be a simpler option. Um, so the next big thing with this stack is poor reliability, and that comes in due to all of these moving parts. Making sure all of it is working all at once is a lot of overhead for a developer or a DevOps team. Um, and the next big thing in that is uh, there's always a bottleneck. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Reddit hug of death. Uh, you know, you get your site up on the front page of Reddit, you get your 15 minutes of fame, you think it's great, um, and then, you know, uh, an onslaught of new visitors come to your site, a part of your stack can't handle it, and the whole thing goes down. Um, and uh, so in that case, you have to scale your stack, and that gets complex. So uh, what I want to cover here is in regards to scaling this stack and keep keeping it all reliable, all of the different moving parts you have to manage. Um, so looking at this, you've got uh, a page case. Uh, or in your database case, you have to manage cache and validation uh, and resource management. On your server, you have to manage uh, provisioning and monitoring and management. On the CMS, you're going to have to do security updates and plugin updates and all the management of that. On the database, you've got tuning and maintenance. Uh, you've got migrations and replications, and you've got backups. And on the CDN, you're going to have to deal with cache and validation and uh, versioning and all of these different things. And it's just a, so, so much for a dev team to manage. And then you have the Reddit hug of death, and you realize that you know, your single server can't handle all of this. So then you've got to scale your stack. And so what you end up doing is you double this, or you triple this, or you quadruple it. Um, and now you have twice, double, uh, triple, or even quadruple the overhead um, with multiple servers running all of this infrastructure. Um, and uh, 
it just becomes extremely hard to manage. Um, Dev, DevOps team in this scenario have to make sure uh, multiple servers are all in sync and all serving the exact same content, um, and it's just a horror show. So the next big thing is poor security. Um, and the, the big issue with these monolithic CMSs in this case uh, is uh, they need to be installed in a server uh, and exposed to the internet, because they're your back end, they're your front end, um, and they're all serving all of your content. So uh, in a lot of these systems, there's methods for hardening them, making them more secure. Um, but when it comes down to it, a single vulnerability in this monolithic stack could compromise your entire system. Uh, this mean, and what this essentially means is you're putting your trust in the provider of the CMS, the developers of WordPress or the developers of Craft, to ensure that the CMS is secure, and then you're taking on the overhead as a develop, developer to actually uh, keep the CMS up to date with all of these security updates. Um, but even more importantly, the security issue falls into the stack with what I like to dub the plugin economy. So all of these traditional monolithic CMSs uh, basically rely on an economy of plugins built by third-party devs to actually add all the additional functionality that you might need for your specific site. And uh, this by itself doesn't seem like a big problem. It seems like a big bonus. But when you consider this security issue where you're already relying on the provider of the CMS to keep things secure, when you're adding in one, two, five, 10, maybe even 20 plugins built by 20 different developers all over the world, you're now putting your trust in those developers to ensure that the code they're writing is secure uh, and isn't adding any you know, opportunities for breaches in your CMS or in your stack. And when, when it comes down to it, you can't put your trust in these developers. So you, as a developer, are taking the burden of all the responsibility for the security of the CMS. Um, and that's a big deal. And to put this into context, uh, I actually have a funny story. We were uh, getting packed up, ready to fly into New York City. Uh, I made a phone call off to my bank provider uh, about my American credit card, asked them to make sure everything's good and I can use it in the States. And they went, uh, actually, uh, it looks like there's some interesting uh, statements here, some charges that uh, look kind of fraudulent. And they were like, it looks like you may have been uh, compromised. Uh, and it, 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 the case had been uh, Equifax had announced a cybersecurity incident affecting about 143 million U.S. consumers, and because my credit card was an American credit card, I actually had, had been uh, compromised. And uh, somebody in California uh, spent about 800 bucks in a McDonald's uh, over a couple weeks, so I couldn't use my credit card over this whole trip. Um, so it just puts it into context how, how important making your, your websites are, are secure and making sure your whole stack is secure. Uh, so the next big thing I want to talk about is cost. And when it all comes down to it, there's two factors with this monolithic stack. You have technology costs. So we were talking about this, your servers, your databases, using a CDN, using bandwidth, CPU cycles, all of those things that developers are familiar with. You're paying upfront cost for that. But then you're also playing development cost and resource costs with your team. You're going to need to hire front end engineers, back end engineers, and even DevOps teams to manage all of this stack. And that's all going to cost you more money to just to deal with all of this performance, reliability, and security issues. Um, and to put this into context, uh, WordPress VIP, which is essentially a, a managed stack for enterprise uh, installations of WordPress, uh, starts at $5,000 per month for up to five websites on their cloud, cloud hosting option, or their self-hosted services start at 15 k per year. So to put that into content, context, in a year, you're basically paying the WordPress team $60,000 to deal with all of these performance, security, and reliability issues. So when it comes down to it, managing this complicated stack isn't easy. Uh, you need deep knowledge of the browser, of server management, uh, of databases, caches, caching and CDNs, the CMS, backup automation, versioning, and just so much more. And when it all comes down to it, none of us want to deal with that. Absolutely not. Um, so the real question is, what do we do? Well, you know, we've been building websites for over uh, 10 years. Can there really be a better way? Um, and as you guys all saw on Bud Talks earlier, there is a better way. Um, and that is uh, the headless CMS and the Jamstack. Um, so, uh, you know, what this is is the modern decoupled stack. It is using CMSs that focus solely on managing your content, 
um, and providing a really good uh, experience for your content editors while empowering devs to use whatever front end and back end technologies they want. Um, and uh, it's the Jamstack. It's this awesome new approach to building websites, which is a lot faster, a lot more scalable, and just a lot more fun, to be completely honest. It's much more fun to build these Jamstack sites. Um, so again, the solution in this case is the Get Back CMS, which is, again, like forestry or Netlify CMS. Um, and we have the API-driven CMS, which is Contentful or Get Cockpit as an open source option. And essentially, the difference between these two uh, options are the Git Back CMS is a layer on top of Git. It's interacting directly with a Git repo. Um, and everything that happens in the CMS is just you know, an action taken as part of the Git workflow, whereas the API-driven CMS is uh, you know, a cloud-hosted option, uh, which is basically just offsetting the, the stack that you're used to seeing in the uh, traditional monolithic uh, stack. Uh, and it's given developers a really nice REST-like API to consume content with. Um, and the JAM stack, just to give a quick brief overview on that, is uh, JavaScript, APIs, and pre-generated markup. And the whole premise behind the JAM stack is you pre-generate markup with build tools, um, and you decorate that markup with JavaScript that consumes from, you know, uh, APIs like Stripe, Intercom, Discuss, or any self-created API that you use internally um, to, that you can deploy to a CDN, serve really fast, um, and uh, you know, give the best possible experience you can to users. So this is where I'm going to get into Git-backed versus API-driven. And my goal here is to kind of give you guys a picture of what's the difference between the two of them um, so you guys can understand uh, which tool is right for you. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is storage. This is one of the biggest differentiators between these two types of CMSs. Um, so getting started with the Git back CMS, uh, the CMS lives in the cloud, and it essentially connects and communicates with a Git repository. Um, your content's living as text files um, in Git, so they're either Markdown or HTML. Uh, or a variety of different formats. Um, and your content model actually lives in these text files as what we call front matter. Um, so it's structured metadata. Uh, and all of your content changes are happening in Git uh, as part of the Git workflow. So you're doing, as, as people are editing things in the CMS, you're seeing commits in Git, you're seeing branches in Git, you're seeing pull requests happen. Um, so it's something that uh, developers are really friendly and familiar with. Um, and developers are using build tools inside the Git repo to basically uh, create an API to uh, build sites with that content, uh, that text content in Git. Um, whereas in the API-based approach, um, your CMS lives in the cloud, and in, and in general, it's communicating with the database in the cloud. That's just abstracted away from the developer. Um, and your content, again, is living in the database. It's structured by the CMS, um, and editors are using a, a cloud-hosted interface to edit the content, and developers are consuming that content uh, using a REST-like uh, interface, using uh, a REST API. So they're you know, dealing with uh, JSON responses like you're seeing there. Um, so the next big thing I want to talk about is cognitive load. And this is another huge factor be between choosing between these two options. Depending on the size of the project you're, you're uh, working on, uh, one option may be better based on this. Um, and what I mean by cognitive load is how easy it is for individuals to learn about your new, your new stack, about the project uh, you're working on. So in the get back approach, developers are really loving this. And it's because um, a database of text files are really, really human readable and easy to understand. Uh, you know, your mom who uses a, Ma a Mac every day or a Windows PC every day is going to understand uh, a set of files and folders and, and can uh, uh, understand that very well. It's very intuitive. Um, the next big thing that makes Git uh, really good is uh, backups and versioning are you know built right in. Uh, it's built into the Git workflow. So um, developers uh, intuitively already know how to do that. The next thing is uh, uh, front matter is very very easy to manipulate. Um, seeing a, a bunch of key value pairs in a text file is really easy to understand. Um, and the best, the big thing about Git is content editors are actually using Git without even knowing about it. So they're using a CMS interface that they're totally used to. It feels like WordPress, but when developers are going and interfacing with the project, they're seeing that developer workflow that they want and they need. Um, whereas in the API-based approach, 
um, large organizations are using this because uh, in the API-driven approach, your REST-like interface, um, your REST APIs uh, give you one single source of truth for your content. So if you're building a, a large project with a website and mobile apps or any other kind of technology like that, um, you're not having to use build tools to purpose that text content in a format you need for those sites. You're using the exact same format. However, it requires a lot more overhead um, because you can't just uh, um, pull down a repo and get started. And so to put this into context, in, in the Git-based approach, uh, to start a project, you basically just pull from Git, you download the dependencies for the build tool, you start making changes, and you build the site. And when you're done, you push, you push your changes into Git, and you're done. The site rebuilds itself. Whereas in the API-based approach, you're pulling down the project down from Git, you're downloading dependencies, uh, you have to authenticate with the API, you have to pull in the content uh, with the build tool, uh, and then work on it from there. So there's a lot more overhead there. So for you know, smaller projects, um, it's kind of overkill. Um, the next big thing I want to talk about is intellectual property. Uh, and this is a huge, huge factor in regards to this old monolithic stack. The reason developers chose to you know, host a WordPress.org site or host a craft CMS or any CMS like that uh, is because uh, we want to own our content. We don't want to hand our content over to other providers. So using a solution like WordPress.com or Squarespace means you're kind of giving that ownership up uh, uh, in, in return for you know, a little bit less overhead. And in the Git backed approach, uh, you're actually, we're actually maintaining this. Uh, you know, all of your content changes uh, are happening in Git. The whole workflow is happening in Git. Your, you know, all of your backups and the history of your entire content is in Git. Um, and uh, you own that repository. A developer can pull that down and go back through the history whenever they want. Um, and it, what it means is you're never actually tied or beholden to the CMS you choose. If you decide that the get back CMS you're using you don't like, you you know pull it out, you move on to another one, you connect with, you connect to your Git repo and you start using that CMS. Um, uh, whereas in the API-driven approach, all of your content and your history is actually stored in the cloud by the uh, CMS provider, which means you're a little bit more tied to that CMS provider. You still have that vendor lock-in that we saw uh, in the monolithic stack. Um, what that means is switching will require DevOps and migrations and you know, all of those things that we want to avoid, we don't want to deal with. Um, uh, but you're, and, and you're doing that to uh, basically get the benefit of having that single source of truth for your content. So it's a trade-off that you need to, you need to pay um, depending on what problem you're trying to solve. Um, so the, the next big thing I want to talk about is solving the old stack's problem. So again, uh, we have all these problems we talked about uh, and uh, you know, how does this new stack solve all of these? And uh, again, the first thing is decoupling the content management system, front end code and back end code uh, really solves uh, the vendor lock-in problem. Uh, given that your uh, uh, content is, is separate from your front end and back end, uh, the markup and code that you use is completely up to the de developer and the back end services you use, uh, you know, the server side processes and database actions you use are completely up to you. Um, so to give you guys some context for this, um, in this new stack, you've got a build tool. Uh, and generally, you know, it's either talking to content in Git or it's talking to third-party APIs. It's pulling that content in, it's processing it, and it's turning it into static HTML, image assets, JS, CSS, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you're deploying it up to a CDN where uh, it can get served you know, lightning fast to the browser. Um, and then using JavaScript, uh, you're uh, talking to APIs in the cloud. Um, and so in the Git-backed approach, all you're really adding into this is uh, the CMS, which communicates with that content in Git. So when an editor makes a change in Git, it gets reflected in the Git repository as a commit. Or when a developer pushes a change up to Git, uh, it's get ref getting reflected back in the CMS automatically. Um, and then the content is, again, read in by that build tool, converted into the static assets, and deployed up to the CDN. Whereas with the API-driven approach, um, you know, the content's getting ed edited in the API-driven CMS, hosted up in the cloud. Uh, the content uh, is reflected in an API that developers interact with. So you know, you're authenticating with that, and the build tool is pulling it in uh, and creating the assets that way. 
Um, uh, and then again, dynamic functionality uh, like uh, comments and user authentication is all handled by uh, uh, API services. So this is where I think this stack really, really shines. Um, so going back to that, uh, going back to the old stack with the plugin economy, uh, you're installing a whole bunch of plugins to uh, get all this functionality you want. But we've been seeing this API economy uh, emerge in the, you know, the last five or 10 years um, where you're using services like Stripe or Intercom or SendGrid to handle complex stuff like uh, payment and uh, customer support and email handling. Uh, and why this is really great is you're trusting major companies to handle all of this complex infrastructure um, instead of you know waking up at 3 a.m. because your proprietary payment system failed and you're having to like sling some code to get it fixed. You just submit a support ticket and go back to bed. Um, so it makes it makes life easier for us. Um, so the next big thing is great performance, uh, and this is through simple hosting. So Really, uh, this, is, this is a no-brainer. In that old stack, we have so much going on. We have all this infrastructure we have to manage. We have to scale it. Um, and in the new stack, all we have is a CDN and third-party APIs. It's a no-brainer. This is where we're you know, getting rid of all of this logic. Uh, and so this simple you know, stack where you have a CDN sending HTML and assets to a browser uh, and, an a and the browser talking to APIs through JS is giving this, us this performance increase that we had all that infrastructure for pretty much for free. Um, and you know, that's just a huge win for us. It means we can get back to doing what we love best, and we can get back to you know, solving real problems instead of trying to solve all of these complex infrastructure problems. And so the next big thing I want to talk about is reliability. Um, and this is due to the distributed infrastructure that we're seeing here. Um, so in this stack, uh, as compared to the old one, uh, you know, you have a build environment. Either your CMS is handling it, or you're using uh, you know a tool like Netlify, which is uh, handling your builds for you. Um, and this is completely separate from the rest of your stack, and you can scale it as you need it. If you're finding builds uh, are taking too long, um, you you know you throw more resources specifically at that problem, and then at that bottleneck. Um, the next stage of this is you know the CDN and the browser. Um, this is completely separate from your build process, um, so, uh, and it's handling serving your site to your users. So uh, this is basically self-handling. The CDN scales itself. You don't have to deal with any you know, reliability or infrastructure problems here. And then the last part is uh, the third-party APIs or the, the internal APIs you're using to you know, add dynamic functionality to your site. So if you're finding these are a bottleneck, you just have to actually uh, either scale these discrete services or go out to the providers that you're using like Stripe or Discuss and complain to, let, to them and let them handle it. So it makes managing the stack a lot easier. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is superior security. Um, and again, this is a no-brainer in this stack. Uh, and this is because you have a secure CMS. Um, because the CMS is decoupled from your front end and back end, if you have security concerns, you can put the CMS behind a firewall um, because all it needs to do is talk to your Git repo. Whereas in the old stack, you would have to deal with uh, um, hardening the CMS. So you know, security of the CMS becomes a no-brainer. Um, you have bulletproof front ends because it's completely static and you have no database or plugins or dynamic server software um, open to code injections or hacks. Um, it's completely bulletproof. There's, there's really nothing here that uh, can get compromised. Um, and your back end are being handled via these, this API economy. Um, so here you have uh, you know, uh, trusted companies that you're uh, relying on them to build security, or you have these you know, smaller services that uh, you're, you can focus on the security of them alone and the communication between the browser and those APIs. So it makes uh, the, you know, the cognitive overhead of managing security much simpler. Uh, and the, the, the other big thing is uh, the distributed infrastructure actually makes security much, much uh, easier. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm referring to here is when we're looking at uh, like the Git-based stack, for example, your security ends up becoming, uh, you know, handling these, these touch points where uh, each, uh, you know, service in your stack is communicating with each other, where the uh, CMS is communicating with your build environment, or where the build environment is communicating with third-party APIs, or the browser is communicating with APIs. That's where you're trying to secure things. Um, and uh, if one of these gets compromised, it doesn't compromise uh, the rest of the stack necessarily. 
Um, and it's the same in the API-based approach. You've really only got these four touch points and you're uh, uh, securing these kind of separately. So let's talk about the pros of these uh, two stacks. So in the Git back, uh, your pros are there's no vendor lock-in uh, because it's your content's all in a Git repo and you're using CMSs that are communicating with that repo. Um, you, you can kind of you know pull out the CMS and replace it at any time. If you didn't, if you don't like pros, you can go to Forestry uh, and that kind of thing. Um, and it also means you have no lock-in to your front end. You can just you know if you decide to use uh, Hugo and decide Hugo isn't meeting your needs, you rip it out and replace it with Gatsby. It, it makes life a lot easier. Um, the next big benefit is devs and editors using the same workflow. So, because the CMS is talking directly with Git, uh, if you're trying to if if you're trying to train your team uh, to understand what's going on in both scenarios, you actually have only one process to train here. Um, you're getting automated backups and versioning. Um, it's a no-brainer. You don't have to deal with it. You just you know deal with your Git history, um, and you've got simple setup. Going back to that uh, you know uh, process of pulling down the repo installing the dependencies and getting to work. Um, whereas in the API driven approach, we've got easy to use content with multiple front ends. Uh, and again, what this means is because you have a single source of truth, you're dealing with an API, um, developers only have to learn how to use, how to interact with the content once and they use the same process across multiple front ends. Um, it's APIs driven CMSs are really ideal for content that changes uh, you know, more than once per uh, uh, minute. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, build process. If you have content that uh, is changing rapidly, you can offset that to dynamic functionality with JS and only build statically uh, the resources that aren't changing rapidly. Um, uh, so that way, you know, your build, your build process isn't getting bogged down and your site isn't becoming slower. Um, another big benefit that we've seen is uh, for large organizations, you're able to roll your own CMS through the API. And that's just something you can't really do with the uh, uh, get back CMS right now. And the real benefit for this is if you need to provide you know, extremely specific interface for a specific kind of editor, you as an organization can do that. Uh, and the real pro here for API driven is there's a lot of choices. They've been around the market longer and there's just a plethora of choices available from Contentful to get cockpit to so many other options. Um, so then let's talk about some cons here and the get back it's harder to use content for multiple front ends. And the reason for that is you're using a build tool to process text files. So uh, you're uh, uh, you know, turning text into HTML. If you want to use a mobile backend uh, or create mobile apps, uh, you're going to have to process that content differently. So there's a little more overhead there. Um, it's not great for content that changes uh, more than once per minute. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is, again, uh, because you're relying on a build tool to build all of your content, um, if builds, builds take time, if you're using a tool like Jekyll, builds can take up to 30 or 40 seconds, depending on how big your site is. And if you've got content changes coming in, you know, 10, 20 times every minute, it means you're just going to have a build pipeline that's backing up. Um, a big con for the get back CMS right now is there's limited choices. Uh, get back is a fairly new uh, thing in the space. Um, and uh, you know, there's, you know, there's about a dozen or less choices out there right now, uh, depending on the, uh, static site generator that you're using. Uh, and the last thing is content queries can be limited depending on the CMS. If the CMS has an API, um, you can do content queries that way. Otherwise, you're going to have to, again, rely on uh, you know, baking the different kind of content queries you have into your build process. In the API-driven approach, uh, a big con is uh, storage and API usage limits. They all come with them. Um, so what it means is you're going to hit a wall uh, depending on you know, how much traffic your site is getting or how many times you're building your site. Whereas in the Git-based approach, uh, you know, storage and uh, uh, usage is free because you're just running a build process. Um, devs and editors are using different workflows. Uh, so what that means is internally, you're going to have to train developers and content editors separately, um, depending on uh, how things are working. Um, backups and versioning is highly dependent on the CMS, and this can be a big problem uh, depending on which CMS you choose. Some of them have great backups and versioning. Contentful does a really amazing job of this, but some of the other options don't have it at all, which means you as a developer then have to take on that overhead again. Um, and one, the big last thing is you have less control over content model and formatting. Um, because it's, uh, because you know, you're relying on the, the CMS, 
uh, to send the content back to you in a REST-like API. Um, it means that you have to learn their proprietary format and you get less control over that. And depending on your needs, that might be something that you don't like. So the TLDR for this, the, the too long didn't read, is uh, Git Backed is really, really good for websites uh, that are static first, and that can be progressively improved using JavaScript to add dynamic functionality. Um, and it's also really great for generating other formats like RSX or, S or XML or JSON or even eBooks. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that shortly. Uh, and the API-driven CMS is really, really great for uh, dynamic applications or platforms that have a website and mobile apps, or it's a web app and mobile apps, um, or for publications that you know have content that changes rapidly. Uh, multiple times per minute uh, because you can you can query that content on the front end with JavaScript. Uh, so I want to get into some quick examples here just to give you guys some context for you know how people are using these different tools in the wild. So I'll start off with us. Forestry is actually built uh, 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 on a Gitback CMS using our CMS. Uh, it's built using the static site generator Hugo, which is really really fast. Um, we actually have dynamic functionality on the site using JavaScript. We use our session cookies to add in logged in state, and it gives the users access to their sites and all that kind of thing, and it works really well. Um, and uh, it's hosted on a CDN. Everything's there. All of our HTML is pre-baked or CSS or JavaScript or images, um, so it gets served lightning fast. Um, another great example is the static e-commerce e website called prettyflyfpv.com. Uh, this is built by one guy here in the States, um, and he basically sells uh, accessories for uh, first-person uh, uh, vision equipment. Um, and there's a really great, great quote from him where he actually uh, tackled this project initially with the traditional stack uh, and came to the conclusion that uh, you know, for 90% of small businesses out there, the uh, amount of work needed to make these stacks even remotely as optimized as a static site is, is just completely overkill. Um, because the stack is just so simple. And for him, it's get back. He's using a get back CMS. He's again using Hugo. Um, he's doing his e-commerce via Snipcart. So he's pre-building all of the pages um, and then decorating all of those pages with Snipcart's JS API to add all of the, the e-commerce state and everything. And it's really, really fast and it's really simple and it has no uh, server overhead whatsoever. So that means he can host all of his assets in HTML on a CDN, and it's lightning fast. Um, the next example I want to go over is Nasty Gal. And they do some really, really cool stuff. Um, they've got a, a, a statically generated website using some uh, proprietary technologies. Um, and they have, uh, they, ha they have a plethora of iOS and mobile apps. And then they also create these uh, single page applications called lookbooks, which are basically stories. Uh, that pull in uh, content from their e-commerce website uh, and uh, teach people about the latest trends in fashion and let people buy those things uh, right there using uh, dynamic functionality uh, powered by JavaScript on the front end. So they're actually API driv driven using Contentful. Uh, they use static site generation for their e-commerce website uh, uh, using proprietary technologies instead of a, a traditional open source static site generator. Um, their whole site is a uh, single page app enhanced using JavaScript. Uh, they use technologies like React and Vue or and Angular, those kind of things. Um, and all of their mobile apps and single page apps are uh, powered by the REST API. Um, uh, and uh, the next thing we have is multi-format publishing. And this is the Getty Foundation. It's and this is a really cool example of using this technology. Um, so they actually uh, have been digitizing um, art and uh, old uh, um, literary works. Um, and they generate a responsive website that people can consume this art online. They also generate uh, ebook formats that you can put on your, your Kindle or your Kobo. Uh, they're generating uh, downloadable PDF formats. Uh, and uh, that are print ready. And then they actually take that generated PDF and make it sellable as a print copy in their store. And this is actually Git backed, um, powered by the static site generator Middleman, which uh, is generating that responsive website, ebook formats, print ready PDF, all in one go with a simple build process. And they're actually serving it all uh, through a CDN so that users are getting it as fast as possible and can consume all of these content. Uh, and uh, it just makes it a no-brainer for them. 
Uh, and then the last thing we have is a multi-platform application. Uh, and uh, the example I'm using here is WeWork.com, which is uh, a company that uh, aggregates uh, uh, co-working spaces all over the world. Uh, and they have a uh, website, which is a static site that's enhanced with uh, single page app technology. Uh, and they also have mobile apps for people to uh, uh, interact with the community. Um, and it's API driven on Contentful. Um, they're again using single page app technology on top of their static site. Uh, and they're powering their mobile apps via the REST API. But you're actually using a Rails backend on top of the Contentful API um, to uh, handle some functionality that they need for uh, these applications. Um, and so they're hosting all of that on a CDN. They're, they're pre-baking as much HTML as possible and then serving the JS over a CDN. Uh, and the reason they use API driven in this case is again, because they've got a whole bunch of different applications uh, and uh, using the API based approach just gives them that single source of truth they need. But when it comes down to it, what do these all sites all have in common? Well, they're fast, reliable, and they're much, much more secure than the traditional stack. Uh, the stack is dead simple, and it's a lot smaller, whether it's API-driven or git back, It's just way better for devs. Um, and it's empowering both content managers and developers to use the tools they want. Um, so when it all comes down to it, uh, you need to choose the right tool for the job, but the tool you use uh, and how you use it and how effectively it meets the needs you're using is what matter. The actual tool itself doesn't. So the moral I want everyone to get out of this is uh, whether you choose git backed or API driven, you should do it on a case by case basis for the project you're using because they both serve you know, really specific needs and they both do certain jobs really, really well. Um, so that's it, guys. Um, and if you, have any like, if you have any questions, just uh, shoot away. Uh, can you elaborate how build process and API interact with its, uh, with each other? Uh, to me, it sounded you either build or you use APIs uh, directly from front end. Maybe I misunderstood that. Absolutely. Um, so what we've been seeing with uh, a lot of these uh, build tools and static site generators is they'll actually consume the APIs at build time. So you'll authenticate with the API during your build process. It'll pull in the content that you want to pre-bake you want to turn into HTML markup. Uh, and then you'll uh, then on the front end using JavaScript, you'll query more from the API uh, as needed. Uh, does that make sense? It does. So how does the build tool know that data within the API driven system has changed and which pieces of the site need to be rebuilt? That's a great question. Um, so depending on the tool you're using uh, and the build environment you have, uh, We'll see, you'll either see the CMS will talk to your build environment and let it know it's changed, or you'll see people using web hooks, um, basically to inform the build environment that a change has happened in the CMS to update it. Um, uh, but what we've been seeing a lot is people will, uh, for content that changes often, um, they'll actually uh, pre-bake uh, as much markup as they can, and they'll actually pull that content in uh, client side using JavaScript and render that into the page. Um, so it's it's a delicate balance they have to play there. Yeah. I'm curious, <coughs> I'm curious how many of the security vulnerabilities you mentioned with WordPress might be mitigated by just using the WordPress API, which I think is getting more popular as a solution. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so uh, if you do use the API, um, I, there is some context where you can uh, put WordPress behind a security, uh, behind a firewall on your own server. Um, you still have to expose the API, obviously. Um, uh, the one thing we've seen with a lot of uh, customers at Forestry, for example, is uh, they come in and they want to use uh, this modern process because uh, you know WordPress is still very opinionated in the API. Uh, still doesn't give you the control you want. So if you're if you're taking an API based based approach, um, it's actually a, a lot nicer to move into these uh, API driven CMSs, which you know are built content first and give developers that like uh, you know detailed control they want over their content model. And I'll just add to that: the people that I know that have used the WordPress API have had to do quite a bit to it to really make it 
you know, fit their needs. Yeah. Um, one common thing we see a lot, uh, uh, we, I had a user that I was talking to a couple weeks ago that said they gave WordPress a go, um, and then decided to take, uh, you know, a static approach with, uh, Hugo and, uh, his big, uh, problem was, is, uh, he was a big, big user of advanced custom fields, like one of the most uh, popular plugins for, you know, adding, you know, metadata to WordPress pages and it didn't play well with the WordPress rest API. Um, so he had to do a lot of, he was trying to do a lot of leg work to actually get all of those fields in, um, and, uh, just came to the conclusion that it just wasn't worth the overhead and the effort, uh, which going back to that example from pretty fly FPV is that's exactly what he's getting at is, um, you can use, uh, tools like WordPress for this modern stack, but there's just a whole bunch of extra leg work and overhead to make it, you know, as performant and, uh, as reliable as these tools are. Um, whereas if you just make the, the move to these tools, it, it, it's there already. So I have a question. Um, I've heard the argument um, against, and, and as you know, I'm a big fan of the Git-based approach, um, and I've heard an argument against it that um, once you keep their content and their code completely separate, so here we've got, you know, one commit might be, you know, a user updating their stuff from forestry, and the next commit might be a developer. Um, what do you think of that? I mean, is that a is that a real problem or is that a problem that we're just kind of ignoring that we might regret one day? Uh, it's something that uh, I know we and other players in the Git back space are aware of. Um, uh, I've seen a couple cool solutions where people have separated their content and their code base and they kind of marry it all together inside a single Git repo. Um, and you'll see, like, for example, in uh, um, people taking the API driven approach where uh, for example, they're using Contentful and they're using, you know, their spaces and uh, they're, you know, segregating all their content into, you know, separate spaces. And then they've got their code base in Git. We're actually seeing people taking that same kind of mental uh, model and applying it to the Git approach where, you know, your content is in a Git repo, your code base is in a Git repo, you're putting them together in your build process and it's working exactly the same way as the API driven approach. So I think it's kind of a non-issue. It's just... Uh, we as leaders in the space need to figure out the right approach and kind of educate the world on how to do it. Thank you. Yeah. So a couple more questions then. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so the API driven approach seems to be um, uh, great, except that it doesn't really solve the performance problem because the data is still loaded from a some API from somewhere that is equally slow as the servers that originally served uh, HTML uh, in the old model, right? How, how does it fundamentally change? And I'm obviously, if a vendor is fast, it's fast. If not, it's not, right? Yeah. So, but it's the same problem as we had with a dynamic version. Yeah. Um, and so that is, that is the big challenge with uh, the API-driven approach is um, the, the whole mantra there is pre-bake as much markup as you can. So at a, at a build time, you know, pull in as much as you can from that API so that you can serve as much of it as statically as possible. Um, and uh, depending on the tool you're using, you're doing that with plugins or, or uh, um, for example, in Gatsby, uh, you're, you know, querying the API and uh, Gatsby's turning that into its content model and then you can use that to build static sites but it's definitely an issue there where uh, you're still as a developer having to deal with um, some kind of DevOps overhead to make that uh, whole process work whereas in the git back approach you know all of your contents living in git um, and you're pre-baking it and then anything that you can't pre-bake like e-commerce functionality and stuff you're just decorating that markup after the fact with you know JavaScript to get that functionality. So uh, like, again, going back to the, the cognitive load example that I was talking about, um, for git backed, it, it's, it's more intuitive, people get it. So uh, it's kind of easier to understand. Uh, in the API driven approach, you can get the exact same performance and you can get to the same place, but it just requires, you know, adding more into that stack to achieve the same effect. Great setup for my second question. So if I have a lot of data, yeah. Uh, and big website, how do I incrementally build it? Because I don't need to rebuild every page, but today's tools seem to be very 
centric on let's build the whole thing every time something changes? Yeah, um, so that honestly all comes down to what you're actually using to as a build tool, whatever's generating your markup. So, uh, for example, uh, the two the two uh, static site generators that Forestry supports, Jekyll and Hugo, actually both support incremental building. Um, and uh, so when uh, Scott comes up to show you guys uh, a quick demo of Forestry, you'll actually see that um, previewing in our CMS is is very fast, uh, either in Hugo or Jekyll, uh, for that exact reason, is they'll look at basically what content has changed, what files have changed, and they will uh, only rebuild that page. Um, there's still a, there's still a concern there when it comes to uh, um, actually deploying the site. The, the logic there is rebuild everything and send it all up. Um, and again, that all depends on what tool you're using because Hugo is lightning fast. As Bud was saying, uh, Hugo can build a, th uh, a thousand pages in a second. So it, depending on the tool you're using, uh, building every page becomes a non-issue. And I want to add, I think, you can confirm this maybe, but Netlify has on one of their plans, it's, it's a, uh, one of the enterprise plans, I think, but where they do... They don't do incremental build, but they'll do an incremental, um, yeah, uh, putting the pages up on the. No, really? So we will we'll only uh, we'll check only change files. Are, sorry, when you build only the change files will end up being deployed to the CDN. So the builds are pretty fast, like you said, with Jekyll and Hugo and whatever you're using, and then our system will check against what we have in our cache and will only deploy the stuff that you changed. So even if you have 20,000, 60,000 files, but you only change two, then we'll just deploy two. Yeah, and that is definitely the key. Depending on who you're using as either a deployment tool or, or a hosting provider, you're looking for those features, those basically those you know incremental deployment. If you're using a, a build tool that's deploying 5,000 built pages over FTP, it's going to be really slow. So um, uh, hosting providers like Netlify, um, and CI tools are, you know, changing the game that way. Sure. So I understand uh, our syncing only changes is never a problem. Uh, that, that's that's an easy part. Yeah. So what if you have a uh, hundred APIs and your application uses all of them and well and the CMS, let's say, yeah. it or not, and uh, uh, how do you track what needs to be rebuilt? Because uh, that means that the the application logic need to needs to be somehow extracted into a build process. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a great question, and a great example of this is if we were to take Contentful, for example, uh, and, and uh, Jekyll. Uh, the way Contentful interfaces with Jekyll is a, a Ruby plugin for Jekyll, and what they essentially do is when you query the API during your build process, they uh, turn the API responses into files. Um, and uh, Jekyll can then diff the difference on files build to build. Um, so again, uh, that's where uh, that approach can uh, be challenging, because you're taking API responses and turning them into files, or you're adding in overhead yourself to uh, um, track the difference in the API. Yeah. Not an option. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you out maybe a bit here. Um, uh, the answer to your question is they, they don't. They yeah. still build everything all the time. Yeah. Um, it, the deployment is, is easy to solve. That's the rsync or whatever. Um, the incremental building that Chris is referring to is generally on a preview or on a like um, watch command. So like Hugo server or Jekyll serve, it will do an incremental build when you change a file uh, but if you're running Hugo build or Jekyll build, um, it still builds everything from scratch. Uh, well, I, what do you mean by dependency management, I guess? WebGen had that feature a long time ago, but it stopped being maintained about six years ago. Yeah, it's a great question. Awesome. Uh, no other questions? Great, guys. Uh, thanks for giving me the time to listen. And I will hand over to Scott to give you guys a quick demo of uh, Forestry, our Get Back CMS.